The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, well, why don't we get started? Uh, what we're going to uh, talk about for the next hour or so is experience in uh, leading change in a rather large, complex organization. And I had the great opportunity to do that at Rolls-Royce in Indianapolis uh, in the years from 2000 to 2004, and then I retired. Came here, I like uh, academia and I like the lean business overall. Just as you've seen in the other um, uh, presentations today, we're going to talk about, from Dick Lewis's perspective, what are the key components which drive enterprise improvement. We'll talk about a number of the essential tools uh, for business improvement uh, to kind of flesh out the list that you saw earlier. Uh, I'll show you some metrics that we used at Rolls-Royce uh, for communicating with the workforce how we were doing. And then uh, I hope that you will agree that uh, improvement is a process. It goes on and on, uh, not an end state at all. So Rolls-Royce in Indianapolis uh, belonged uh, to General Motors for many, many years. Uh, and uh, it uh, has a long uh, history of producing uh, engines for a wide variety of uh, aircraft. Uh, at one point in time, I could claim that we were the only engine manufacturer that operated on all seven continents because the reprovisioning in those days of the Antarctic uh, missions was all done with C-130s. Uh, some unique product families, uh, lots of customers, uh, and, uh, and lots of engines in service, which meant that there was a, a business not only in new engines but also in spare parts. The company was really uh, hidden in the round-off era of General Motors uh, and allowed to innovate and reinvest and not behave particularly businesslike. Uh, and uh, so it was spun off by General Motors in 1992 to a uh, leveraged buyout firm and then subsequently resold to Rolls-Royce in 1995. And what Rolls-Royce inherited was a company with great products, good customers, lots of excellent technology, uh, but a company that didn't know how to make money. So that was somewhat of a problem. Uh, there were, it's a fairly complex company with uh, many business sec sectors, uh, uh, several different product families which are completely different physically. Uh, and the volume of operations was on the order of two engines every day and about a million dollars of parts, which in hundreds of dollars each is a lot of parts every day. Um, a uh, fairly good-sized workforce, uh, uh, half of which were unionized uh, in an inherited United Auto Workers Union from General Motors, a large old factory that was built during World War II with many uh, obsolete uh, pieces of equipment, uh, and a good-sized business. A billion and a half dollars worth of sales is not at all bad. Uh, so what we're going to look at is the story between 2000 and 2004 or 5, uh, which was uh, our lean journey. Now, as we said earlier today, uh, every enterprise has many stakeholders. And in fact, if you even think, because those of us who fly on regional jets uh, are also stakeholders because we're, we're flying customers on those regional jets that are powered by the Rolls-Royce engines. But there are thousands of pilots and maintainers and other users of the airplanes. There's lots of customers that buy them. Uh, there are a number of partners. We found ourselves partnering in some instances with General Electric and other instances with Pratt & Whitney. Uh, and uh, then uh, lots of employees. Uh, we had uh, dealt with our supplier network uh, actually just a little bit before I took over, uh, but having had thousands of suppliers and then gotten that down to about 300 by some consolidation and some uh, tiering of suppliers. It turns out that governments are also key uh, stakeholders, not only the federal government because they fund the military uh, engine purchases, but states because they're concerned about uh, you know, stable employment and taxes that are paid, and the same thing is true of local governments. Uh, and, uh, and then you go down to the community and they're concerned about noise and pollution and traffic in their neighborhoods and so on and so forth. Uh, 
finally, it's obvious that the stakeholders of Rolls-Royce uh, uh, are uh, a big, uh, the shareholders are very big uh, stakeholders as well, as was the union. So a lot of different constituents, uh, all of whom you had to consider as you were implementing change. Now, in, in my opinion, and this is extracted from uh, going a lot of places, reading a lot of things, listening to some very bright people, uh, but in my opinion, the first and foremost thing that one has to have if you're going to implement change is a vision of where you want to be. And that has to be simply and clearly articulated to everyone in the organization so that uh, there, there can be buy-in and subscription to that. Uh, you have to focus on your customers and on your employees. Of course, the other stakeholders too, but the customers are so important because they are the people who buy from you and allow you to pay your payroll. Uh, active leadership and involvement uh, with the workforce is absolutely uh, key. Um, you know, I spent hours and hours in our factory and in our offices uh, as a part of my everyday routine. Every um, week I sent an email to all employees. Every time there was a major uh, issue that we had to deal with, we would gather people together and talk across the company and, and uh, communicate. You have to be willing to change things because a lot of what we do is because we've always done it that way. And that's not necessarily the best way to do things. You must have trained empowered and, in my opinion, incentivized employees. Uh, a constancy of improvement activity and, uh, and, and a way to celebrate uh, and reward success. So, our vision was taken from Rolls-Royce PLC, the, the British parent. It's called Trusted to Deliver Excellence. But that's a rather abstract term, you know. Uh, what does it mean? Perhaps if you were schooled in the UK, it, you, it would come very naturally. But to a Midwestern United States workforce in Indianapolis, Indiana, we translated it. And we said, okay, it's determined by customer satisfaction, first and foremost, measured by a few understandable metrics, supported by a workforce that's trained and empowered to deliver the improvement, and across the entire business. So that was our... That was our translation of our vision, and that was what drove us in everything that we did. Now, I will tell you that there have been uh, just a few uh, really key leaders who have led their organizations uh, with a constancy of improvement over a long period of time. And the first we talked about this morning was John Galvin, who brought Six Sigma into Motorola. Uh, Jack Welsh then amplified on that and actually built an entire business philosophy around uh, uh, being uh, number one or number two in the businesses, working out your problems, developing wonderful leadership training, and using Six Sigma. So those things happened over a long period of time at General Electric. Larry Bossi actually was an alum of, uh, of General Electric, and then Lou Giuliano on here, who was my boss at ITT for a number of years, worked for Bossity. So you, as you can see, that whole clan came out of, uh, came out of General Electric, uh, kind of interesting. Uh, as did Jim McNerney. Uh, Clay Jones, on the other hand, at Rockwell Collins is a completely different animal. He was a, he was a naval av aviator uh, and uh, subscribed early to uh, Lean and, and truly is a full spectrum of visionary leader. Now you don't do this without knowledge. That's why training courses such as this are, are really essential. And um, there's two components that we talk about here. We talked about the Six Sigma with capable world-class processes, and we talked about lean with streamlined value-adding activity focused on the customer. So at Rolls-Royce what we did is we actually used a hierarchy of knowledge delivery. The first thing that we did was uh, teach people how to work in teams. Uh, that is not uh, something that people uh, often have uh, uh, in their background, and successful team working is really key. Now, I was, I was very impressed by the way that you have worked together here in this class. So something's happening right here at MIT, but that's not always the case. Uh, so then, once we had the team and the leadership skills uh, in, ingrained in the workforce, uh, we selected, selectively trained people at various levels 
of competency in Lean and Six Sigma. Uh, a few people become black belts, which is really about the highest level you'll find in large proportion. But there are a few people who really have certified mastery, typically only a handful in a, in a big company. You go into Boeing and there's you know, four or five who I would say are really certified masters. Um, and, um, and then finally, uh, rarely and hardly ever do you find people who are so uh, knowledgeable about Lean and Six Sigma that they truly become teachers or sensei uh, in Japanese. Uh, one of them was at uh, Pratt & Whitney for many years, Mr. Ito, and they named uh, the Ito University after him, which is their uh, executive training uh, facility in Hartford. Uh, we had uh, Dr. Junichi Taguchi, who you may be familiar with from uh, the design of experiments work that he uh, led. So uh, the hierarchy of knowledge is very key. Now, the knowledge then is typically structured uh, in a, uh, around what we now call domaic. This is kind of the uh, natural evolution of the old Deming cycle, uh, but uh, is now has a fifth component. So we, we talk about defining the problem, measuring the situation, analyzing the data, improving the situation, and then finally controlling it. So domaic is a virtuous cycle, and it has uh, many, many components uh, embedded within it. Uh, so let's talk about those uh, on the next several charts. So on, on define, we do such things as doing a process map like you've done today. And uh, define the problems. You haven't got to that yet, but you will as you turn that into a value stream map. Uh, putting metrics on them, which you've done. You've taken the basic metrics for the process map. And then setting some improvement goals. Well, it's implicit in the Sasha and Andy exercise. Uh, that they would like to have more customers. So, you know, if they're going to do that, what are they going to do? Uh, how are they going to change their cycle time, which is far too long, to meet the tack time desires of 75 or even 100 customers? So having done that, then we measure, and uh, by analyzing each component of the process, we put data on it. You put things like time, inventory levels, uh, the m amount of rework, uh, the cycle time, all of those things. Uh, you can, uh, in some instances, apply probability and statistics to those uh, if it's not a clearly uh, closed form uh, issue. Uh, you know, like for example, the cleanup. I mean, is there that? That's kind of a uh, uh, that's kind of a uh, probabilistic issue because you don't know when you're going to do it. Uh, data collection and analysis, and having the right kinds of measurement systems so that you can determine process capability. Analysis, there are many tools, uh, and uh, those of you who uh, may go on to pursue green belts or black belts in Lean and Six Sigma will be uh, exposed to a lot of these things. Uh, perhaps the best body of knowledge that exists along these lines is supported by the American Society of Quality. They have a large manual that goes into all of this in detail, and they have also uh, uh, web courses that you can take uh, to, to learn how to do each of those. Uh, and then in terms of the improvement, uh, you know, the uh, things that uh, we usually find are we do what's our Kaizen or burst type uh, exercises where you get all of the knowledgeable people together in a room to work and solve a problem. Uh, if it's more of a uh, intellectual issue, you can use design of experiments or Taguchi uh, methods uh, and so on. And then finally under control, Earl just showed you a number of things on visual factory and andons. We talked this morning about can, can bands. Muda is waste. You want to eliminate Muda. Poka yoking is fool proofing or mistake proofing, and you want to do that. Uh, and we talked about 5S or 6S. And finally, total productive maintenance is maintenance that's keyed to the signal that you get from the equipment that you're using so that as you see it drifting away from a desired state, you do the maintenance then as required, as opposed to just having a, every three months you do maintenance. So these are some of the essential tools, and these are tools that we trained our people. Now, uh, I'm a believer personally in a few simple metrics. This morning before uh, I came over here, we were meeting with Raytheon, and they actually have an executive in their corporate staff who maintains a uh, set of metrics for the CEO. Um, he has about 15. The problem that you have when you have that many uh, metrics is that uh, not everybody can understand them. And it's hard to 
danced or uh, marched to 15 different drum beats. It's a little bit confusing. So what we did is we used the voice of the customer, uh, the customer being both the external customer and also the internal customer, to help us define the uh, most important shareholder issues. And so in our case, it was on-time delivery. It was really, we were, we were struggling to meet on-time delivery because it was the beginning of the regional jet business and the, the customer demand was very, very high. And uh, you know, we were trying to ramp up production. So that was a problem for us. We had several supplier-related problems with our delivered product quality, the worst of which was the uh, electronic fuel control on the engines, which were built uh, uh, by Lucas in the UK. And uh, they suffered from uh, a rash of, of false uh, diagnostic messages that were, you know, they said that there was something wrong with the fuel control, but there really wasn't anything wrong with the fuel control. But that drives the airline customer crazy. So uh, we had to deal with that. We had in our own factory first pass test yields. We were having to go back and rework and retest too many of our engines, and it was also compromising our on time delivery and our cost of non quality. In our finance organization, we had simply never addressed the issue of collecting money from people who owed it to us. And we had, you know, in two, the year 2000, I think we closed the year with $50 million of past due receivables. And you know that may sound like a small amount of money for a billion and a half dollar company, but the fact of the matter is, is that the way our financial structure was organized, we had to pay 10% interest on that $50 million, which means I lost $5 million of uh, potential profit because of those uncollected receivables. And then finally, we used the standard parameter that I showed on the chart this morning of return on invested capital. That's a little bit more abstract and hard to talk about with the, uh, with the employees, but we were able to emphasize that uh, the invested capital included all of this inventory that we have in the factory and uh, you know, the work in process and, and the uh, engines that we couldn't deliver because they didn't pass the tests. So we concentrated really on the denominator of the return on invested capital. The, the pricing, what the customer pays, controls the numerator. That's harder for us to control, but we could control the denominator. Uh, what it showed is, is that we had uh, a continuum of initiatives over time, um, including membership in the Lean Aerospace Initiative. But what we did is we, we started in areas where there was low hanging fruit. So we started uh, with um, uh, some of our factory cleanup. We started with working with our suppliers. Uh, then as we uh, got a little bit more mature and had more people trained, then we started cross-training our workforce so that they had more lean and Six Sigma skills. And in our, uh, in our unionized workforce, we uh, actually multi-trained, multi-skill trained people aiming at changing the uh, contract with the union in the future. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, we gradually added third-party parts suppliers and uh, outsourced some of the uh, stuff that it didn't make sense for us to do because our, uh, our average labor cost was very high. Okay, so here we are. It's the year 2000. Uh, my uh, predecessor had been fired uh, because the company lost $50 million and he didn't know it and the CEO didn't like that. So I got drafted actually to uh, do this. I was happily running the defense side of our business, uh, but having done this sort of stuff at ITT and elsewhere in the past, uh, they said, you gotta do this for us. So I, I agreed. And uh, the first thing we did was try to mobilize the leadership team. I had about 15 or so direct reports that covered all the functions in the organization uh, and uh, so we, we got together and we spent some time agreeing on the vision, setting priorities for the company, establishing the metrics, uh, reassigning some key people. For example, the number two design engineer was reassigned to uh, run the engine assembly. And that sounds like a strange uh, transition, but indeed, it was, it was absolutely key. Uh, I had to fire the controller because he was part of the financial problem and we got in a new controller who knew which way it was up. And, uh, and then I took the number one civil a aviation salesman and put him in charge of supplier relations. So, you know, it, th th there were some uh, changes that were, uh, you know, deliberate in their intent in order to try to 
uh, put stronger people in some of the key jobs that we really had to do. We focused on data. Everything that we tried to do, we tried to have data to, to do that. And we started making early investments to deal with some of the roadblocks that we had. And so back to the question this morning about how quickly can you make change, there was a lot of things that were happening that could be significantly improved. And, and indeed, we got wonderful results in the first year. Uh, but much of that is because the results before the first year were so absolutely horrible. But we made improvements in on-time delivery and in quality. We got our first pass test yields moving in the right direction. Uh, the cost of nonconformance uh, improvement by 3% may sound like a small number, but the gross number was $150 million. So it was real money. Uh, we uh, went through the factory with uh, a vengeance and, and anything that wasn't being used, we sent off to the scrap metal dealers. Uh, we worked hard with our government customer to deal with the processes of, uh, of closing out government contracts. Uh, in the finance area, they looked at uh, the complexity of our financial accounting and were able to eliminate about a quarter of that. And so as a consequence, we turned the financial picture around in a year and uh, we were also, I was very fortunate that Rolls-Royce uh, um, allowed uh, us to uh, actually provide incentive compensation to everybody in the company. Uh, now, there were, was incentive compensation for the uh, union members. That was bargained into their contract. Uh, but Rolls-Royce uh, very astutely uh, understood that if we couldn't include everybody from the secretaries to the, uh, uh, you know, the leaders in, in the various test areas and all, that it wouldn't work. So we were able to do that. Uh, now, stability is important when you're implementing change. And so we uh, uh, very uh, were conscious of the need to, uh, you know, be consistent. We reaffirmed the first year's actions, uh, but we then started on some new things. This year, it was time to, to figure out how to deal with those overdue uh, receivables. So we set up a, cost, a cash collection team. And it was really amazing. Uh, it, it turns out that uh, there are a lot of organizations in this world, including the bill payers that are hounding us these days, who, who really have a process for collecting cash. And what we did is we trained our uh, finance and accounting people uh, using those models. And, uh, you know, it began to come together very well. We also recognized it took too long to assemble engines, and we were doing it in a, in a one at a time basis. So we, we began an investment in a flow line, which allowed the engine to be built from the compressor all the way up through the end as it flowed down a line. And where, whereas it used to take 30 days to assemble an engine, we, our goal was uh, 10 days. We hired a third-party parts supplier, somebody to actually control all the nuts, bolts, and screws, and little things. It was silly for us to manage those, so we hired uh, actually UPS, and they purchased them to our specs, warehoused them for us, and then delivered, us, delivered them to us uh, in Kanbans. And training, of course, and working with suppliers. So in the second year, uh, the momentum was there. I mean, the, the, the employees really uh, bought into this. They were being told how they did. Every week they knew, every month they knew uh, the financial performance. And uh, so now, uh, you know, we're getting almost okay on-time delivery. Uh, and uh, we've reduced the cost of non-conformance by 10% now. Read $15 million. It's real money. Uh, got the delinquent receivables down from $50 million to $25. We're headed down and delivered record cash and profit to Rolls-Royce. So again, we were able to uh, reward our employees. And the typical reward was about 10% of their salary. So that was, uh, that, that's meaningful when you get more than a month's pay. The third years, uh, we uh, uh, did some work fine-tuning priorities, uh, and uh, particularly we're working uh, on simplifying the way we operated in the factory. Uh, uh, our historical labor contract was the typical complicated mess that's driven the U.S. automotive business into the ground. Uh, literally, to do, we had a hundred different job categories and uh, no one could do work out of their job category. So if you were a, a receiving uh, person in the incoming material dock, that's what you did. You could not then deliver that material to the shop floor, or you couldn't even 
work on the outgoing dock and send it out, even though the work was exactly the same. Uh, if you were working, uh, um, you know, nothing could move in the factory without using material handlers. So these guys, you know, they had a racket. They would drove, drove around all day in their, in their bicycles and their forklifts. And, you know, uh, it was very little value added. I mean, in the lean sense, it was just horrible. Our strategy was to cross-train people so they could do multiple jobs and then to bargain subsequently with the union to eliminate some of those job categories and simplify the way work was done in the factory. So that was, that was the reason for that emphasis there. We completed the flow line. Uh, it was really amazing. The Duke of York came uh, uh, to uh, dedicate the flow line. And uh, you know, you can imagine uh, what excitement there was to have a British, British royalty coming in, and he's a very handsome fellow anyway. They just absolutely went wild. It was <laughs> fantastic. Uh, we started tearing down stuff we didn't need because, you know, it costs money to heat and light and, uh, and insure and all the other stuff. And I talked about our third-party logistics. The transactional black belts thing was an experiment. Uh, you know, there is various places you can do this. Uh, we used the George Group, which uh, was a very successful consulting firm in Texas that I had worked with, uh, to train a, about a dozen of our people in finance and in human relations and in uh, legal and, you know, all those other areas. And, and it re really worked well. I also used them, uh, I, I forced all of my direct reports to live through a three-day Lean Academy, so, so we did that too. So the results would have been spectacular except that we had 9-11. And uh, that was a real challenge for us because we knew that although there was a uh, backlog in work, that we knew that the orders for the following years would be greatly reduced. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out uh, how best to respond to that. And uh, the whole company, actually, in, in the UK and the US, we all had the same uh, issue here. Um, so we spent about two months before we actually took any uh, decisive actions, because we wanted to think it through and really understand uh, what the consequences of this would be, because we wanted to emerge after the aftermath of 9-11 as strong as we had been going in. The other thing that I did is, along with the president of our local union, uh, we addressed every single employee on every shift, um, I think about three times. You know, first of all, saying what we knew and what we didn't know, and then talking about how were we going to try to deal with it. And the way we dealt with it was uh, by offering uh, incentivized early retirements. We had a number of retirement eligible people. And um, the, um, we also, for in the union, they have what they call buyouts. So for younger people who thought that they could make a career change, we would offer them a lump sum of cash. Um, and um, so there were very few, uh, actually very few uh, involuntary separations of that. So it, it was handled well. We had, you know, it was handled as humanely as it could be. Um, so as a consequence in here, with, with the downturn in volume, uh, we, we saw some of our metrics actually improve because, you know, if you're not making things, the cost of, no, of non-quality is going to go down. And, uh, but at the same time, we were still satisfying our customers, and we have got our wonderful uh, world-class engine cycle time now, and, uh, and you know, uh, we delivered significant cash and profit, and people did get incentive compensation. So those are good results. In the fourth year, um, we needed to still work on quality, and uh, we were closing in on a new uh, labor contract. Uh, so we completed the shop for multi-training and, and we, we finished off on uh, some of our uh, Kanban activities and, and our factory modernization and I retired. That had always been a plan. Uh, you know, I, uh, I wanted to work uh, something like 45 years and that was about where it was and uh, it was time to go on and do something else. So they changed me but the vision didn't change and, and the, uh, the organization uh, uh, you know, had momentum. And so as a consequence, there were continued improvements in on-time deliveries. Uh, the quality and uh, non-quality were pretty static. We lost our, we lost our quality lead, which was really a, a problem. Uh, 
she, uh, she left for personal reasons. And um, so we got good customer satisfaction and, and basically continued the uh, journey that we had been doing for the last four years. So in the fifth year then, the, all the energies of the company, now I'm gone, but all the energies of the company were focused on this contract with the United Auto Workers. The reason why this was so important for Rolls-Royce is that our competitors have much easier to live with unions, like the, uh, the machinists union. Uh, and, uh, you know, the UAW is really a tough union. I mean, they and the Teamsters are probably the hardest to, to deal with, but they're also very smart. And, um, you know, so we did negotiate a breakthrough contract. We eliminated a lot of the unnecessary job categories. We, uh, you know, actually provided more compensation to our employees because they had multiple skills and they were worth more. Um, so that was great, but it was a distraction. And then, we had, after the contract was signed, then uh, the operations guy got transferred back to England, the manufacturing guy got a great job down in Georgia, and the quality lady that I talked about left because she had a death in her family, and uh, it was very sad. So, so that, um, uh, that did cause some loss of momentum. And, uh, you know, but there were good results that year. I mean, the contract allowed them, and it was a four-year contract also, so, uh, long-term sustainability, uh, the, uh, uh, the metrics continue to be established. They've won uh, a, a joint contract with um, uh, General Electric for the engine, for the alternate engine for the uh, Joint Strike Fighter, and again, uh, got incentive compensation. Now that's 2005, and uh, people always ask me, well, what's happened since then? And what's happened since then is that there have been more good things happen. Uh, there is certainly the focus on lean uh, manufacturing operation. They're working on lean product development activities. They're very lean in their finance activities. They've been able to invest in uh, a new uh, light helicopter engine. Uh, you may know that the, uh, the most uh, successful new training helicopter is made by a company called Robinson the R22, and they're coming out with a turbine-powered version of that, which will be exclusively a Rolls-Royce uh, Model 300 engine, which is, which is very good news, too. There's some bad news. They drifted away from LAI, and uh, uh, I, was, I was very sad, very disappointed about that. But uh, on balance, things have gone pretty well. Now, when you go to lean, there are lots of other beneficial changes. And what this chart captures is the enormous volume of paperwork that was existing before we started to do lean. And, you know, by uh, eliminating so many of these things, which turn out to not be necessary, you up free up people's resources to do important work. And so, you know, I don't want to go through all of these in detail, but I can tell you that it was a very major sea state change, which allowed us then to, you know, focus on better product development, better customer support, better manufacturing activities, and, uh, and uh, good profitability, et cetera. So if you try to uh, capture these things on a, a kind of input-output, uh, in the input we increase the employee training every year. It's really important. And we transition to a multi-skilled workforce, which allowed us to change the union contract. Modernized over 50% of the facilities and our employees uh, were empowered to earn significant incentive compensation. Uh, in the output area, our cycle times were reduced by more than two-thirds. Inventory turns better than 40% better. The cost of non-quality halved. Uh, On-time deliveries to benchmark levels. Customer satisfaction improved by 50%. World-class cash collection. Earl, you had a question. Yeah, can you explain what inventory turn is? Uh, inventory turn is a ratio of the, um, of, of the inventory that you have on hand and the time that it takes to liquidate that particular amount of inventory. So you talk about in like days of inventory, um, a, a spacecraft will have 300 or 400 days of inventory before they actually liquidate that inventory and sell a spacecraft. Toyota has hours of inventory because it's hours from the time that they get the material and to the time that they deliver the car. So that, that's, those are inventory terms. Yep. Okay? All right, so benefits to Rolls-Royce. 
when I took over, our primary customer at Embraer, uh, the regional jet maker, wouldn't even talk to us in Indianapolis. They refused to talk to us there. They would only go to the UK and talk to uh, our super bosses. Uh, we fixed that. Uh, we reversed to mediocre cash collection and, and, and finance performance, secured future lines of business like the Joint Strike Fighter engine and the, uh, the new helicopter engine. And the best practice is that we evolve, like the flow line, like the cash collection activity, like the customer, uh, uh, like the supplier, um, uh, third party supplier stuff. That was all then uh, translated to the UK and is in use there now. So that's, uh, that's great. And that's the wonderful thing about a, a, a large corporation is that the best benchmarking is internal benchmarking. Now there are barriers, there were barriers. We had uh, lots of uh, uh, underground resistance and skepticism. And, and you will hear this whenever you're put in charge of, uh, of change management. And people are comfortable with the way things are. So, you know, it's easier to not change. But um, you have to deal with that. And, and way we deal, the way we dealt with it is we very clearly had a burning platform. This is a term you'll find in a number of the books on lean, and they say, well, if, you have a, if you're on an oil platform and it's burning, you know you've got to do something. Well, our burning platform were you know, intense customer dissatisfaction, absolutely horrible financial performance, and the very real risk that if we didn't get our act together, that Rolls-Royce could close the whole operation in Indianapolis and move the work elsewhere in the world. And so not wanting that to happen, we had three very compelling arguments to, to do better. You have to work uh, to get the buy-in, and you know, that's you know, why we started with the leadership team and then distributed, and they had to do that. We used uh, policy deployment uh, to flow down objectives into every organization. Communication, it, it is impossible to communicate too much. Uh, you just have to do it all the time, and you have to be consistent, and you have to be, and you have to target your communication so that you know that it's getting to the right people and that they are understanding it. You know, question and make sure that what you're saying is being understood. Uh, you have to dispatch some resistance, usually not too very much. Uh, in most corporate environments, uh, the resistance is somewhat passive and people will modify their uh, behavior uh, if they know they have to. It's a little less that way in government and in academia. I've worked in all, all those areas as well. Uh, uh, but we did uh, reassign several people uh, away from things they wanted to do, and there were a number of people who uh, left the company to go do something else. Um, but finally, and this really comes uh, from years of watching the Malcolm Baldrige process, which is a U.S. Um, uh, initiative to encourage uh, industrial excellence uh, headed out of the National Institute for Standards and Technology in Washington. And in all the Baldrige examples that I can remember, uh, there was always rewarding or celebrating success. And uh, whether it's uh, Canon sending people from their factory in Williamsburg, Virginia to a quality symposium in Japan, or Millican uh, carpet makers in South Carolina having a giant picnic for all the employees, or whether it was us sending teams to the UK for uh, our, our annual quality conferences, uh, recognition and rewards are very important. And I, I, I think. We, we would have made some progress without the ability to uh, financially stimulate the activity, uh, but it certainly is very helpful. Okay, so observations. Finally, uh, this is a journey. This is a five-year journey, and it continues. Um, you, f you find that business conditions do change along the way, and they force you to adapt. Um, uh, but as long as you have a constancy of leadership intent, as long as the leadership is in agreement that uh, change to improve customer satisfaction and business performance is essential, then uh, that helps to deal with all the changes in business con uh, conditions and, and changes with your competitors because you know, your, your competitors are getting better all the time as well. So staying still is really not an option. The better you get, the more there is to do. So with that, I'd like to uh, ask you if you have any questions, and I'll try to answer them. 
Okay. The question is, uh, what is the difference, if you will, between the various levels of competency uh, and knowledge in Lean and Six Sigma? And I mentioned yellow belts, green belts, black belts, and, um, and master black belts. Uh, basically, it's the amount of knowledge and experience that you have. So, uh, you know, a class like this would probably qualify as a, as a yellow belt. Uh, you know, to become a green belt, you really ought to work on a project or two applying these uh, principles. Uh, to become a black belt, you have to lead projects which produce tangible results. And typically, uh, most companies um, require uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars of savings to be demonstrated before they would uh, affirm that that's a black belt. Master black belt's higher than that. Does that answer your question? Okay, thank you. One of the first observations you made was that, you know, your early uh, benefits from uh, implementing improvement are, are, you know, significant. And then there seems to be uh, a diminishing return as you keep working on the same thing over time. And that's true. But what happens is that in any organization, you can only deal with, you know, certain processes at a time because you don't have enough resources to deal with it. So, you know, when you reach an acceptable level with, with you know, say, a process, then you, if you look adjacent to that, you'll find other opportunities for dramatic improvement as well. So it's, it's possible to keep uh, momentum going for a long time. Now, you, you also raised the issue about um, it, it's more fun to create new processes than, than it is to be the maintainer of processes. And that's an issue that we have, especially with, with creative people like engineers, uh, you know. Um, but uh, the way that some companies deal with that is that they actually have what they call process councils. And at Boeing, at Rolls-Royce, you, uh, you have process ownership councils so that, for example, uh, the, um, uh, the people who do uh, preliminary design have a process council and they work across the company to, you know, share, uh, you know, best practice, to uh, share problems and issues, and then to, you know, develop and evolve the body of knowledge that is associated with that particular set of processes. So, um, you know, it, it is important to have a process owner. It's important to sustain attention on that. Uh, because otherwise they can drift away. And, uh, and the question is, uh, you know, if you are too structured and focused on improvement activities, does that stifle creativity? Um, I don't really think so. But the way that we dealt with it is that we uh, set aside pockets of our company that were uh, specifically chartered to be creative. So, for example, we had uh, a, an organization that is kind of like the uh, Lockheed Skunk Works that was there to focus on very advanced, far out engine concepts. We had, uh, a, I had a, a, a group of people who uh, were just entirely focused on uh, innovating uh, new factory models. So uh, th there were pockets of creativity surrounded by uh, stable, uh, process-oriented activity that paid the bills. Okay. You know, certainly 9-11 uh, was the most challenging. Um, the most rewarding is seeing people succeed uh, after having, you know, grown and, de and evolved uh, in their skills and capabilities so that, that you know, I had many people that I worked with who went on to other leadership positions in Rolls-Royce, and that's great. That makes you feel so good. Yes, we did. And what we had was there, there was, a, there was a, um, uh, an announced formula that said that, you know, depending upon the amount of uh, success, financial success that the company had, then there was a uh, sliding scale, uh, and in the case of the whole employee incentive pool, it went, I mean, it could be zero if we didn't meet our goals. If we met our goals, they would get a 5% of their uh, normal compensation, and if we exceeded the goals by like 100%, they, would, they could get up as much as 10%. So it was on a, on a, a sliding scale. Did that answer your question? I'm not sure. If you couldn't use something like If that. I couldn't, okay, what would I do? All right. 
If I couldn't do something like that, then I would go fight with my human resources department to a budget for, uh, if you will, basically um, uh, non-salary type compensation, so award type money. And I would use that, but also I use, uh, and, and, and we, we did anyway, uh, we used a lot of recognition. So, uh, you know, people who did good things you know, were paraded in front of the leadership of the company and, you know, got to speak at our management meetings and got introduced to the CEO and, and all that kind of stuff. We, we you know, whenever uh, the, uh, the chairman of, of Rolls-Royce would, would come to Indianapolis, and it was two or three times a year, you know, we would parade him around to areas that were doing good work and, you know, introduce the people and talk about, you know, why that was important for the company. And then uh, we did, uh, within Rolls-Royce, we had an annual uh, quality conference in the UK, and we would send uh, two or three teams of people, so maybe as many as 20 people would go to, to the UK for a week and listen to, uh, they make presentations and they'd also listen to other people from all over the world doing that. So, um, you know, it's, you need a combination. Cash is important because it helps pay bills. But uh, the, uh, uh, you know, the personal recognition and, uh, you know, acknowledgement of, of having done good things is very key. We did use uh, what, what's called various terms of management policy deployment. And so every one of my leadership team was obliged to mirror the activities that we were taking at the top of the company in their own organization. So it would vary from, uh, you know, place to place. In engineering, it might have, they might, I think they actually made more changes in engineering than we did in the uh, civil airline business, for example. So it, it depended upon the uh, individual department. Okay. And, and uh, you know, I, I would recommend uh, uh, Collins's book, Good to Great. It's, a, it's an excellent uh, review of the attributes of highly successful companies, and you know not the uh, you know not the ones that uh, get all the the hoopla necessarily, uh, but uh, uh, the one parameter that's in there that I uh, really subscribe to is that um, a an effective leader uh, needs to acknowledge the contributions of the, his entire or her entire workforce and not assume all the glory. So, you know, you look at people like Dennis Kozklowski or even Jack Welch for that matter, uh, I don't think personally that that's, the, that's not the kind of leader I want to be. Okay. Earl. Dick, uh, many organizations when they start their lean journey find they need to tell the employees that nobody's going to lose their job as a result of productivity improvements. They may lose their job because the business goes down or or, but not because of productivity improvements, to assure them that they're not going to work themselves out of the job. What did you do at Rolls Royce in that respect? Well, uh, you know, first of all, we didn't necessarily advertise uh, ourselves as just a lean initiative. We, we, you know, we said we have some, you know, major business issues that we have to deal with, and we're going to have to improve across the company. And it is, you know, unless we do this, we're going to lose our customers and we're going to lose our jobs. So we didn't use lean as a rallying call or anything like that. We used the lean principles and practices. Uh, some people uh, quip that lean means less employees are needed, but if you ever do that, you're in deep trouble. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>